Welcome to Macro Musings, the podcast series where each week we pull back the curtain and take a closer look at the important macroeconomic issues of the past, present, and future. I'm your host, David Beckworth of the Mercatus Center. We are glad you've decided to join us. Our guest today is David Schleicher. David is a professor at Yale Law School and is an expert on election law, land use, local government law, federalism, state and local finances, municipal bankruptcy, and urban development. David joins us today to discuss the role the federal government has played historically in responding to state and local budget crisis and its implications for today's COVID-19 crisis. David, welcome back to the show. Thanks so much for having me. Oh, it's great to have you on. You were one of the early guests on Macro Musings. In fact, I was looking back. It was in May 2017, if I got the date right. So that was about a year into the podcast. In fact, I don't think we even had nominal GDP mugs back then. Did you ever get a nominal GDP mug? I got the mug. It's great. Uh, me and my uh, my colleague, uh, uh, Yair Listikin, who also had, we both have the mugs and we, we bring them to faculty meetings. So it's a, uh, it's a much coveted item. Fantastic. Well, if nothing else at Yale, we are convincing the law school to be fans of nominal GDP targeting. <laughs> that's awesome. So you got your mug. That's great. But you were an early um, guest in the show. So thanks for helping make this podcast what it is. And uh, I encourage our listeners to go back and check out that episode. We spent some time on a paper of yours titled Stuck, The Law and Economics of Residential Stability. And that was a very fascinating conversation for me, David. It really tied together some thoughts for me in terms of why these local issues matter for the macro economy. And um, maybe you could just quickly summarize it for our listeners again and maybe give us an update. What, what's happened since we talked last about it? Yeah, so thanks. Um, so that paper argued that uh, interstate mobility, people moving from state to state, was falling. And it's kind of a, a relatively well-known finding. But I argued that it undermined uh, the, the the use of the dollar as a kind of an optional currency area. It also undermined kind of the agglomerate of efficiency of the U.S. kind of, kind of fit between people and jobs. Um, and the growth that that can create of people living and working together, and also undermine the mechanisms of federalism. Um, and it further argued that state and local policies, uh, all policies, all, all federal policies also, but mostly state and local policies, uh, had made mobility worse. Um, they did it by um, restricting entry into hot job areas, by uh, making it hard to build housing. So like, limits on housing in Silicon Valley, um, which kind of limit entry into those markets by restricting labor mobility through occupational licensing regimes, by uh, restricting mobility by making benefits of a variety of sorts from pensions to pensions to housing, that things turn on where you live so that you can't carry them necessarily with you when you move, um, and by refusing to aid states and localities in allow and kind of uh, shrinking when the economy um, goes beyond. And the claim in the paper was that this had, uh, these policies were having a deleterious effect on mobility, which was then having a deleterious effect on these kind of broad uh, national goals and the national economy. Obviously, in some ways, you know, it hasn't been that long. It feels like a long time. I mean, March 2020 feels like it was six years, but it's only <laughs> been a couple of years since the paper came out. Um, and if you want to think about the ways things have changed since I wrote that paper, you could think about it in kind of two ways and in two periods. Um, the first one would be like, how has policy changed? And the second one would be, how has the underlying ec economy on which that policy operates has changed? And then the other one is right now during the pandemic and then in kind of projecting forward to a post-pandemic world. On the policy front, there have been some encouraging and some discouraging signs during the pandemic. I think the most encouraging sign has been in the occupational licensing world, where there's been real a lot of reform, particularly along health, in healthcare, which is the kind of most regulated sector on these scores. So law would kind of be a second, a close second. Um, in that area, you saw um, a lot of uh, removals of restrictions on interstate practice. That to kind of places that needed nurses, get, bringing them in from other states, you saw, and you saw a vast increase in allow, allowing telemedicine. Um, and, and you've also seen in a couple of states like Florida and Arizona and a few other places, some broader changes in occupational licensing rules. On the housing front, on the other hand, I think that you can think of things as a little negative during the pandemic. 
the mechanism for making changes in many places has stopped as they couldn't meet and they couldn't do public meetings. Um, uh, and in some places, like particularly the New York City area, I think the politics has shifted against kind of liberalization of housing markets. Uh, California is a slightly different story, it didn't achieve some of the radical changes that some people there sought, but you, there's been kind of general chipping away uh, at, the, um, at, the, at the problem. So I'd say on the policy front, uh, it's been a, a, a mixed bag. Um, the, um, next question, like, like one, the reason this is a problem is because it's kind of interacting with the economy and we're in the middle of a vast economic change. And so you could think about this again in two periods. One is like during the pandemic and then is, um, after the pandemic. And so, um, during the pandemic, there's obviously not a ton of moving about, um, we're staying at home, but, um, in the after period, people, some people think that. We're, we're right now we're talking on Zoom. Um, they think that there's going to be a vast increase in working from home, and this will have the effect of rebalancing the U.S. economy such that we need less mobility um, because there'll be jobs in more places, that will have fewer superstar cities, or that superstar cities will spread their economic, you know, some people will, tech jobs will move from San Francisco to Nashville. Um, for instance, like Adam Ozimek just has a recent paper, a neat paper um, uh, uh, suggesting just this, um, and uh, uh, I have to say, I'm a little skeptical of this claim, but if it's true, the harm of the policies in stock would be less. I mean, obviously, no one thinks that you're going to, that working from home is going to result in the decimation or the elimination of Silicon Valley or anything, um, but just some marginal changes. But the uh, negatives of the policies would go down if more and more people could work from wherever because they're doing it online. Um, the reason I'm skeptical, though, is that um, uh, people have been arguing that information technology would lead to spreading rather than concentration forever. So the Tofflers are kind of the most famous example of this who argued in, in the future, we'll all be in our, uh, in a, you know, huts in Montana or something, uh, and we'll just be video conferencing to work. Um, Ed Glazer kind of famously argued that uh, um, uh, at least thus far, uh, IT has been more of a complement to in-person location than it has been a substitute, although it's a bit of both. And why is that? Well, First, you can run bigger and more far-flung operations from headquarters with better and better IT, and that's also true for video. So you can have that you can concentrate the top executives in one place and run a global empire in a way that you could not in a uh, period that, with less IT. And the second is that we frequently use information technology to set up in-person communications. Like people go on Twit Tinder to go on, so they can go on dates. Um, or they use an email to set up a coffee, or they have an unbelievably frustrating conversation on Twitter, and then they meet the person for a beer. So thus far, that's not, that's not to say that it won't in the future that we won't see greater gains from working from home um, and, and spreading out. But thus far, that hasn't been the case. So we'll see. Ozimek also argues that um, all of the gains of in-person communication, all the, what, we call, what economists call agglomeration gains, the benefits of in-person location, both of deep labor markets and of uh, information spillover, which is kind of learning from others, can be replicated online. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, I'm somewhat skeptical of this. And the reason I'm somewhat skeptical of this is not like people who live in cities don't also use online tools. So like Slack is used in an office where people are already there. They're just also then using it to additionally see other people. And so you're getting the online stuff and you're getting the, the in-person stuff. And same thing goes for Twitter and everything else. If Ozimek's right, we're going to be on the cusp of a massive increase in working from home. He thinks that that won't be occasioned with a productivity decrease. I think it will. But of course, I mean, who knows on some level? It's, uh, it's, it's hard to say. One last thing I'll say about this is that the stuck and kind of the worldview it captures was getting some criticism in the period after I wrote it, but pre COVID and the kind of two forms. I'd say the period right before the crisis was kind of the high point of uh, people being into place-based policies. I went to a conference, the Federal Reserve in Boston, and a lot of luminaries were arguing for the attractiveness of place-based policies, subsidies to declining areas. Larry Summers was, it, was on this, Tim Bartek, a whole bunch of people of that, of that ilk. Um, and uh, oh, it's kind of separately, a kind of group of people like uh, your former guest, uh, Morgan Ricks and uh, Ganesh Chidran and a few other people kind of attacked stuck and uh, arguing that rather than moving people to jobs, which is like allowing mobility so people can move to jobs, we should regulate industries such that the jobs move to the people. So we should re-regulate the airline industry to provide more subsidies to far-flung airports in order to encourage the jobs to move where the people are stuck. Um, 
Uh, I think people should pay attention to these criticisms because I think that they're bad, um, uh, but it's important to kind of think about the way that they are. So economists got really into place-based policies of so Patrick Klein, I think is kind of the most notable and argued kind of made a, a very convincing theoretical case that uh, place-based policies could be an efficient form of redistribution. But I think these things are pretty insensitive to our actual politics. When you actually look at place-based policies, they often look a lot more like uh, the 2017 tax bills uh, opportunity zones uh, uh, rule, which end up spreading them across all 50 states, end up being targeted at richer areas than you'd think, and end up a lot of the benefits end up accruing to um, real estate owners rather than poor people who work in these areas. And so... The, I think the and I think that that's kind of a systematically like that's a likely effect of the way we structure Congress. Something we'll get back to in a minute. Uh, and I think that uh, other arguments, like like uh, Morgan Ricks's argument, uh, are problematic because I think that they, first of all, I think they kind of miss a little bit about the economics literature, which doesn't suggest that like people meeting jobs anywhere is equally good, but rather that they're gained from things happening in the same place. Um, and further, I think it's kind of a, based on a nostalgic view of um, like where people should live. It kind of says where people lived in 1950 or 1970 is good or 1910 or whatever you want to pick. And we should aim to replicate that as much as possible. Um, uh, but where we lived in 1910 or 1950 or 1970 were products of a particular set of transportation technologies and information technologies and economy. Um, and we live in a different one. And there's no obvious reason to me and not no argument that they, uh, they, are, they make clear to me that why we should seek to go back to something else, given the ways our economy has changed. And so, but it's, uh, but so I, those are the kind of variety of things that have happened since stuck. Well, that's interesting. I have a few follow-up questions, but in general, agglomeration economies still hold, they're still important, and something that I think many of us don't think carefully about. But one development since this crisis I I wanted to run by you is, you know, part of the movement to get labor mobility up is to increase the supply of housing in big urban centers where there are lots of jobs. So, you know, upzoning, all these, you know, pushes against nimbyism, and we're both fans of this, and you're you're an expert in this. And so it looked like we had some momentum going, and this crisis hits, and then you hear this commentary. Well, this shows you why we don't want to increase housing and concentrated numbers of people in cities because of viruses. I mean, is that just a temporary observation? We're going to get past that, and that will soon be forgotten. Um, you know, I suspect uh, that. Um the argument against housing construction has uh, transforms over time because <laughs> it's a kind of ideological representation of the desire either for a lack of change or really to preserve the value of housing uh, of, of people who already yeah. own land. And then they say other things. And so there've been periods they've said wildly other things. So one of my favorite examples of this is that um, the early NIMBY movements in California and Los Angeles were rooted in something called the zero population movement. A group of people who thought that the world population was exploding and this was a problem. And they thought it was a kind of a coherent ideological pr- platform to be against housing in, in the Hollywood Hills and to reduce population growth in Africa. And they thought this was like, well, it's all less people or something. Um, and these things doesn't make a ton of sense, but it was, it provided a mechanism for people to, uh, things you can say in public to justify your your belief that people shouldn't build housing near you because it will depress the value of your uh, investment. Um, and so the other thing I'll say about this is that stuck is based on metropolitan moves, right? And so a lot of what's been happening or the debates about things are about things that are intra-metropolitan. So people moving from Manhattan to Westchester. Okay. It's all one labor market, but you know people may want to live it slightly less. They want to have a yard or not have a yard or that kind of thing. Um, right. And that the stuff in stock is at least somewhat insensitive to that, right? Like it's just like a metropolitan area is the is the is the variable that it's concerned with. Um, uh, the value increase and kind of the demand for urban versus suburban property kind of goes in response to a whole variety of factors. One of which could be in person disease. And so, obviously, if we see a lot more pandemics, um, not only this one or this one lasts longer, or um, then it could have bigger effects. The same way that like increased urban crime can have an effect on those inter kind of inter metropolitan moves. Um, and again, it could have an effect on national, right? So I don't want to dismiss that possibility because if people are, gen- I mean, if we think that it is genuinely scarier to be in New York City than it is to be in Montana, um, I, again, there's some debate around this subject about the relationship between density and 
uh, susceptibility to the to the disease. Um, uh, there's some push and pull. The evidence. I, I'm no expert on this, but there's a debate, a big debate on the subject. Um, uh, I'd say the correlations look very, very weak if they're exist okay. at all. But perceptions what matters, right? And so um, because it's you know who wins among people writing papers back and forth may have an effect on behavior, but it probably is less of an effect effect than what you know it appears in the media or whatever. Um, and so. Uh, it could, depending on what happens in the future. I mean, like one of the things that uh, the kind of broader principles in stuck is that we should accommodate people where they want to live, wherever that is. And so if people want to spread out, that will require land use changes also, right? So if people, if there's increased demand to live in the suburb and decreasing demand to live in the city, one thing you have to see is housing growth in the suburbs, right? And that could be the exurbs where there are no people. And that's usually a pretty easy place to build, but inner ring suburbs of rich cities have been made much more restrictive even than big cities. So like the housing growth in Nassau and Westchester County is minuscule. Um, housing growth in Silicon Valley is minuscule. And why is that? Well, that's where homeowners are at their most powerful. Um, and so uh, the broader principle behind stuck is not like cities are awesome. People, everyone should move to cities because, you know, it, instead it's the economy suggests places to where people should move, so society, but also like the kind of relationship between information technology, transportation technologies, and like what we're doing um, uh, change over time and people move in response to those economic forces and politics or policy needs to accommodate those moves or ought to accommodate those moves because doing so will produce economic gains um, for the broader economy and not just the local economy. Okay. Second question and, and final one on, on your paper stuck, and, and that is the bigger point that you raised with me last time, and that is the decline in labor mobility, the decline in convergence among states' economic growth has consequences for the United States as an optimal currency area. Uh, we're a long ways from not being one, but we're slowly inching away from being one, and that means it makes the job of the Federal Reserve much harder to apply a one-size-fits-all monetary policy to regions that are growing apart. My question is, since we talked, again, not that long ago, but since we talked, has the case stayed about the same? Or we do you think we've inched a little bit more away from being an optimal currency area? Where yeah, I'd have to think a little bit about, more about it. I don't have a, I don't have an obvious, a clear answer there. Uh, I mean, the two variable, like stuck is focused on one of the mechanisms for making something an optimal currency area, which is the ability of people to move when yep. there are regional shocks. But another factor is how regional those shocks are and how different economies yep. are. And that is uh, like how that interacts with the pandemic is something that is um, sort of changing every minute. Um, but I'd have to think about it a little bit more to have a have a clear answer. Okay. Um, and so the other one, though, another factor in this is the degree to which the um, federal government is doing uh, geographic redistribution, right? So that they are they are either had with the, the systems of automatic stabilizers or with um, you know like kind of intentional uh, regional uh, kind of regional moves, uh, and the which would then make the shocks more common. Um, and I think you've seen some things in that direction. So the federal government is obviously doing the pandemic, spent a lot of money, and uh, uh, it, its effect on regional kind of ends up, it, a lot of it went more to small states than big states. Um, and you'd have to look at that in relationship to the regional shocks and the mobility factors, kind of, and put them all together. That's a great point. You know, Hugh Rockoff has this paper that asks the question, when did the U.S. become an optimal currency area? And he says the 1930s. It wasn't until the 1930s. And the reason being is because of all these federal government programs that were put in place that could either, you know, bring the regional cycles into sync or at least offset the ones that were painful and different from the national cycle. And so I think your point is what we're seeing today is this this large response from the federal government, which exactly what you would want in an optimal currency area. Yeah. And I mean, you've seen a little bit in this direction in Europe with the, the, the Europe wide borrowing system, which gets a smaller than many people wanted, but the idea was very much uh, kind of in a similar, if we're going to have a Eurozone, we're going to need to transfer money from one part to another also have some effect on trade balance and a bunch of other factors that are, um, uh, you can talk about with other people about, but it's uh, one of the things was making, using fiscal policy to make the Eurozone more of an optimal currency area. Okay. Well, that's a nice segue into your paper that I really want to spend the rest of the time on today. And the, the issue I outlined at the beginning of the show, and that is the role the federal government has in responding to state and local budget crisis historically. And what does that mean for 
today's COVID-19 crisis. So you have a great new paper. We'll pro- provide a link to it on the show page. And the title of the paper is Hands-On, Part 1, The Trilemma Facing the Federal Government During State and Local Budget Crisis. So folks, here we have another trilemma. So step aside macroeconomic trilemma, which is related to the, o- the optimal currency area discussion we just had. But step aside macro trilemma, and let's, let's bring in a new trilemma that's more at the micro or state level. And it's very interesting, a very thought-provoking paper. And before we get into your paper specifically, I just want to outline some of the um, maybe facts or developments that have happened at the state and local level, because clearly this is a recession that has a bearing on that. And I'm going to read just a a paragraph from a report uh, on this issue. It comes from the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities. And they have an estimate of how much damage is going to be done. And so they state that they now project that the state budget shortfalls expected from the COVID-19 economic fallout will total a cumulative of $555 billion over the state fiscal years 2020 through 2022. That's that's quite a big chunk of change there. Um, that's the shortfalls, and it doesn't include local and tribal governments. So it could be even larger if you start looking at local governments as well. And they also note the millions of jobs that have been lost and more may be lost soon here. You know, we're we're at the end of the extended or the, the generous federal um, government unemployment insurance, $600 a week. There's talk about extending it, but whatever happens, it looks like it's going to be less. And there's a lot of concerns this will bleed into the uh, state and local government finances. So everything from police, firemen, teachers, um, highway maintenance, all these things are going to be really hit hard. And and I think we talked about this last time, but in 2008, a big part of the Great Recession pain was at the state and local level. Um, they, they really had to contract and pull back. And the question is, what role does the federal government have, if any, in responding to the distress at the at this lower level? Now, in the, under the CARES Act, there's $150 billion that was provided, which, again, seems small compared to the $555 billion estimate, which may grow. And so your paper was great because it provides a context in terms of what has been done in the past and what does it mean for the future and, and really for the present crisis. So maybe you could we could start off with just kind of a, a bird's eye view, a summary of what your paper is about, and then we'll maybe look at it piece by piece. So one thing I'll say is that there you can think about federal aid to states in kind of two ways. One is general federal aid of the form that the CARES Act what took the form of, which is money goes to all states. And this is kind of best thought of as a form of distributive spending, right? So that instead of the federal government spending the money, it gives money to the states to spend it. Um, and this doesn't really implicate some of the concerns in this piece, uh, but is very much what the current political debate is about, right? So how much money should, is it 550 billion? Is it a trillion as the House Democrats have suggested when you put in local and um, tribal governments. The claim in the paper, um, we're kind of of, mostly it's a history of federal responses to a kind of slightly downstream question, which is what happens when things go beyond like fiscal problems to kind of acute fiscal crisis, when a state or city is on the edge of defaulting on debt. Um, And the claim in the paper is that at that moment, the federal government faces a choice and it can't achieve all of the ends it might want to. Um, you can think of the kind of literature focuses, the existing literature focuses on two things the federal government w- might want to avoid, which is the uh, kind of people like Jonathan Rodden and Bob Inman argue that if we give bailouts to cities, states and cities, so an Illinois is on the edge of bankruptcy and the federal government says, we'll give you a bunch of money so you can avoid defaulting on your debt, that this will create moral hazard and further it will create resentment from other states. And so this uh, would lead, as Rodden argues, to greater federal involvement in state and local politics that uh, Rodden's argument is that kind of the federalism has two um, equilibrium. One is the federal government does a lot of money raising and does a lot of oversight of state budgets. It's bailing out everybody effectively uh, and doing the money raising, but it's like deeply has his fingers in uh, in state budgeting. And on the other side, uh, you have a system in which the federal government agrees to never bail out or thinks it will never bail out or states kind of a no bailout policy and states and localities are uh, relatively independent. Um, but absent that, you end up with problems like you saw in Brazil and Argentina in the 1990s, where states and cities understand that they uh, the federal government will back them up, uh, but the federal government isn't providing any oversight of their budgets, and they will just spend and spend, and they'll create a, a crisis for uh, uh, the country. 
Um, a second concern is true, for, one that also applies to general aid, but is uh, is a particularly acute in acute fiscal crises, which is a, a kind of uh, acute fiscal crises happen during recessions. They involve huge cutbacks in spending. Um, if you pay, need to pay your debt, um, but getting no money from the federal government, you've got to stop spending on the things that you would otherwise be spending on. Uh, this involves a lot of firing of people during the middle of recession, creating huge labor market problems and decreasing um, spending. Uh, you know, about 12 percent of the overall U.S. economy works in uh, state and local government. Um, and so this is a, a large swath of the labor supply. And so, as you noted, in the Great Recession, um, decreases in employment in state and local government uh, kind of substantially extended the length of the Great Recession. And what my paper says that, in fact, there's a third concern uh, or a third policy question and a third concern, um, which is the uh, uh, ability of states and localities to invest in infrastructure. We rely on states and cities to do most of our investment spending, whether it's in roads or higher education or any kind of future oriented investments. There are real reasons why this happens. And we can talk about that in a second. Um, but this relies on their ability to borrow. And if states and cities default, uh, that will have the effect of reducing the confidence of the initial bond market in uh, invest lending money to these states and local governments, uh, which would decrease future investment. And the claim in the paper is that this presents a trilemma in the sense that you can, if you do a bailout, you don't worsen recessions and you don't destroy the, com the confidence of bond markets, but you do create more moral hazard. If you don't allow default and you don't do a bailout, um, you'll have the effect of, you, you, can, you will avoid moral hazard and you'll avoid harm to the bond market, but you'll worsen recessions. Um, and if you allow default or encourage default or don't stop default, um, you'll avoid moral hazard and you'll avoid recessions or kind of direct temporary hits on the macro economy, but you'll decrease future investment. And you can get two of these goals, but not three. And that's the claim in the paper. And it goes through the history of um, federal responses to default crises in states and localities and notes that we've responded in lots and lots of different ways. Uh, uh, we've chosen different legs of this trilemma at different times for different reasons. Um, uh, but uh, the problem is always there. There's no avoiding the trade-off that I suggest. You kind of have to pick your poison. Yeah, it's super fascinating. You have a nice table, excuse me, on page 14, where you highlight these trade-offs. So again, the federal officials can only avoid two of three harms, moral hazard for state budgets. Number one, number two, worsening recessions. Number three, reducing future state and local infrastructure investments. So you got to pick which one you want to um, tolerate and, and which two you want to, to get rid of. So it's a fascinating question. But another point you raised in your paper, and maybe we'll get to this as we get into the history, is that both of the kind of standard two observations, the moral hazard concern, the, the macro stabilization concern, they both conclude that there's been a handoff approach from the federal government. Federal government has stepped back. Fiscal federalism proponents say, look, it's great that the government's been hands off. And then the, the, more, the macro stabilization folks are like, well, it's been hands off and we pay a price for it. But both of them reach the same conclusion. And you say not so fast, right? Really good. So this is um, the the kind of implicit history in the um, kind of the literature is that in the period before the 1840s, we did bailouts. And so this is kind of most famous, the Hamilton's assumption of state debts. This is the idea is like the state governments have, had borrowed a lot of money during the Revolutionary War and the federal government assumed those debts. Um, and that's a bailout. Um, uh, and the claim in the literature is that this titanic moment happened in the 1840s when uh, a number of states in the territory of Florida were on the edge of default and Congress considered a bailout and rejected this bailout. And the claim in the literature is that this moment created a turn that we no longer did bailouts um, and that this uh, meant that the federal government largely took the hand a hands-off approach to state and local fiscal crises. And uh, my claim is that first I say note that bailouts are a little more common than this literature success, uh, suggests. They, Washington, D.C., there was federal aid in the New York City fiscal crisis in the 1970s, federal aid a little bit kind of late in the Arkansas road debt crisis of the 1930s. But what this literature ignores is that there's another policy question, which is, okay, you're not going to do bailouts. Who's going to bear the harm? Creditors or current taxpayers? And we see a lot of policymaking in these crises that are about allocating the harms across those two groups. 
Um, I think the reason that the kind of policy discussion has ignored this is that a lot of this policy making, uh, not entirely, but a lot of it is made by courts. And people treat the courts like they're kind of mechanistic actors. They're enforcing contracts or enforcing sovereign immunity as it kind of exists in the clouds or something. But the courts are making a lot of this up as they go along. They're in kind of a swaggering policy making mode in a lot of these areas. Federal government is often backing them up in certain interesting ways. Um, uh, but they are thinking about and discussing and fighting over the exact same trilemma-like concerns that you see in the other two branches. Um, and uh, this question of should creditors take the hit or should um, should we like really stick it to current taxpayers and make them pay their creditors has been a, uh, I'd say, a kind of a more common political fight than the question over bailouts. The basic reason for this is that until, um, particularly in the period after uh, the beginning, the the um, after the 1840s, through uh, through uh, say somewhat more recently, federal government didn't really have the fiscal wherewithal to do lot big bailouts. That um, state governments were just bigger in a lot of ways. State and local local governments were much bigger, and so the ability, the their ability to do bailouts were um, were somewhat limited. So a lot of the fighting took in the took in the form took the form of this question of allocation between these two other concerns. So another way of saying this is that. Even though 1840 appears on the surface to be a clean break, there's been kind of a backdoor or an, an implicit, you know, support all along that that kind of belies the fiscal federalism view. Yeah, so it's not that it's a backdoor; it, that there's another policy concern that they have didn't okay. focus on, right? So that there's this other dimension. It's in the same policy universe that they're thinking they're not thinking about or not thinking about as the same type of question, but is in many ways the same policy question. You saw this a lot, of, and again, in many of these crises, you see kind of moves at different points focused on different elements of them. So that some point during the middle of a crisis will shift from a no bailout to a little bit of a bailout view or from a creditors need to eat it to, um, or, you know, to we're going to protect the, we're going to protect the creditors. And you see, you see shifts during the middle of crises as well as over time. Um, but it's another dimension of the policy that, uh, the existing literature doesn't take too seriously, but it's, I think, um, kind of been the more, uh, salient one throughout most of American history. Um, uh, and so. Okay. Well, it's interesting because I read some commentators during these past few months, um, for example, being worried about the Fed's municipal lending facilities. So you know, the Fed is now helping out the municipal bond market. It hasn't done much there, but just its stated support has lifted that market. And and I've seen some commentators say, hey, you know, the federal government's kind of breaking the rules of fiscal federalism by doing that via the Fed, even though the Fed's off balance sheet. But I guess my here, here's a question I have, and this may be way off, but there's always been some funds flowing to states from federal governments. I mean, the state of New York complains about this all the time. If you look at the balance of payments between states, there's always some states that receive a lot. Some of the poor states in the South, for example, they receive a lot of federal government funding in New York gives out far more in federal taxes than it takes in. So there's always this issue underlying these other issues, at least. But maybe this is far afield from the point you're making. Uh, no, I mean, so the state governments uh, get a lot of money from the federal government. And so you're when you talk about the, the the argument that Cuomo made in New York, that's looking at the broad economic receipts, like it counts money that's spent on the military in the state. And that's not running through the state government. But lots of money does run through the state government. So the federal government matches Medicaid spending, for instance. Um, it has a complicated formula for doing so, but it matches and actually increased them in the kind of phase two bill under uh, kind of in the COVID crisis, the second the second of the three stimulus bills. But the federal government does provide lots of money to states. Um, the difference between, and then the CARES Act provided money to all states, right? So it provided yeah. $150 billion. It had an allocation mechanism that gave more to small states than to big states, but it provided money to all states. Um, the... A uh, thing that makes the municipal lending facility different, and one of the reasons why it, they've been so limited in their approach, I think, um, is that that does look a little bit more like a bailout in some ways of a state. So because the money uh, is going to Illinois, but it's not going to Virginia or not going to Utah. Um, because those states don't need to borrow in this way. Um, and so it is a more targeted response 
uh, to a local fiscal crisis and creates concerns, at least in theory, about moral hazard. Now, the way the uh, MLF has been set up has been designed to try to avoid these concerns. It's um, I mean, it's very much in its structure, like a kind of classic central banking structure. So they, they their goal was to provide liquidity to the market. So the municipal bond market was totally stopped up. There were runs uh, going everywhere. It was very, very big in March. And when they set up first, the, the first they did it through the money market. Uh, facility, and then, uh, then, and then through the municipal lending facility, the goal was to stabilize the market, and it was like kind of very classic central banking, right? So it was like we're going to provide liquidity on penalty terms. So the interest rates the MLF offers are above market or above what they, they think market is, um, uh, and it's really only for jurisdictions that kind of can't borrow in the private markets. Um, and they, what they did was they stopped a run. And that it worked in that respect. Um, it's only thus far been used by uh, the state of Illinois. Um, but many people have argued, no, we should be doing more through these uh, through the MLF. We should be doing like really helping states out of their fiscal crises. And the MLF has not done that. And I think the reason, I mean, I don't know, but I think the reason is that they um, uh, they are very concerned about these kind of moral hazard and other concerns because they're going to that uh, the it's I don't think it's particularly believable that the Fed could impose conditionality on money. So traditionally, when we provide aid, uh, kind of bailout money, one of the ways you limit the moral hazard concerns is you make it bad to receive it. So the lent, so like the IMF or the World Bank or um, uh, states with respect to cities that they're giving money to will frequently say, you get the money, but uh, you have to accept an emergency manager. So that's like state cities. So you lose local democracy or control board. We saw that in Puerto Rico. We saw that in New York, um, uh, Washington, D.C. also. Um, or you have to accept these changed policy terms. The Federal Reserve isn't going to go to the state of Illinois and say, you need to change your state fiscal constitution or reform your pension clause in your state constitution. Um, it would risk the Fed's political independence. And no one really thinks they know anything about this. You know, like it's a, it would be a weird role for them to play. And so their ability to condition bailout funds is, I'd say, limited to zero. As a result, uh, they've, they've been reticent to get as involved as uh, some of your guests and Liz Warren and a few other people have suggested they should. Um, or they they ought, they ought to. Um, uh, and maybe that's right, maybe it's wrong. Again, one of the points of this payout paper is that there are always trade-offs. Like there are real benefits to providing bailouts. There's just also costs. And there's no, there's no, once you get, if, if a jurisdiction, I mean, you could debate whether any state is at near default. Um, you don't have to be at default because again, uh, it's a choice at some level and we can talk about that in a minute, but it's, um, when you get to that point, there are no good answers. It's all, it, it stinks no matter what you do. Um, and uh, that's what makes it a trilemma. You make choices in this respect. Yeah, but these questions are particularly poignant right now because we're in the midst of this crisis. It's an unusual recession. It's not your typical garden variety demand recession. This is truly a, a large supply shock. I mean, it, it this took the floor out from all the state's normal funding you know, sources. So this is an important question, question to deal with. Um, Let's go into the history. Because one thing I could say, ahead. one thing I could say, really, which is like a lot of the argument for these kind of broad aid packages, like give money to every state, even if it's not a state in crisis, is that it allows you to, if you big enough, it allows you to avoid some of these specific crises, right? Yeah. So that like um, it may be the if you're judging whether giving money to states versus making the unemployment. 500, 600 or 700 dollars or something you're trading off between those dollars. Um, one of the arguments for giving it to states vis-a-vis -vis the other you know, one is their kind of direct uh, macroeconomic effects. but another argument is that actually it'll, it'll help us avoid having to deal with the situation of what to do if Illinois gets close because Illinois would get some money it, it would I mean ironically or kind of interestingly in this regard um, states that are in worse fiscal position going into a crisis will are likely to be worse transmitters of stimulus because they're going to be using some of their money to pay their debtors, yeah. their creditors. Um, uh, and they're less like, they're still going to have to fire people and all the negative things that they have to do. Um, and so uh, it's the federal government has some interest in um, interest in uh, their fiscal position, even if they're giving money to everybody. Uh, but it, uh, it is an argument for the kind of general aid pack. So I like, I think that general aid packages are a good idea. Um, uh, and one of the reasons I think they're a good idea is that these situations are so depressing. 
That's interesting. So it makes sense to send money directly to households and let that indirectly flow into the state coffers. Or send money to all states, right? So send all it to states, Utah yeah. too. You, if Utah doesn't need the money to pay it to stay self and it can spend it on tax cuts or hiring people yeah. or whatever it wants to do. Um, that money will also have a stimulative effect. Illinois, Utah is not going to just like take the money and sit on it. Um, uh, and so, um, yeah. Yeah. This also crosses over some other uh, policy debates I've had on the show in terms of the Fed. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but you know, the, the Fed, like you mentioned, you could arguably say the Fed's response to the state municipal bond market was a liquidity response. It was trying to stem the run in the market. And some would say, though, it's a, also it's becoming a credit policy where you veer into these questions you're talking about. And so where do you draw the line between a true liquidity facility and a credit facility? And, and I think the thing is that they're terrified about it, too. I mean, I just like they're acting, yep. and I don't have any insight, particularly insight into their in, internal debates or anything. But like, at least in this one area, I don't know about all the other ones, but in this one area, their reticence at becoming like involved in credit policy in a more dramatic way is um, is is clear because they've not made it a particularly easy facility to use. Yeah, no, this is fascinating. Well, let's look at some of the history here and we'll start in the far past and work up to the present. But maybe summarize for us again the big one, the 1830s, 1840s, the big state debt crisis. Why Why did the states in the first place get to this position? What was the what happened at the federal versus state level that led them there? So the federal government wasn't investing in infrastructure. Um, the federal government has a real... So one of the reasons that's kind of motivates... The federal government has never been, with a few small exceptions, a very big investor in infrastructure. They took up the National Highway Program. There are a few periods where they... But never have they provided more than 50% of the money spent on infrastructure. So, there have been a small periods where they've spent more than 50% of the capital expenditures. But if you figure in operations, it's never been that high. Um, and particularly early in the government, there are debates about whether the constitutionality of uh, the federal government spending a lot of money on infrastructure. And states really took the lead. So the most famous example of this is the Erie Canal. Uh, New York uh, borrowed, it created a kind of very novel system of financing to fund it. And the Erie Canal is this giant success. And every state in the country says, oh my goodness, we want to have the Erie Canal. And so you start seeing canal construction everywhere. Um, and you, in the South, you saw a lot of uh, state borrowing to um, uh, fund banks. They're creating state banks to invest in in in, in cotton production, or whatever else they're doing in their economies. Um, and you see a uh, economic crisis um, uh, in the late 1830s, uh, and states continue to borrow. Um, actually, uh, Nicholas Biddle is in London, um, uh, and he's like encouraging investors in states are they're really good at and indicating quietly that the federal government is standing behind these debts. Um, and uh, Brits had had done very well investing in American infrastructure. Um, of course, remember the federal government has assumed state debts at least twice uh, in, the, in the 40 years that preceded this or 40, 50 years that preceded this. And um, states got way, way, way over their skis. Um, and it happened virtually ever. Uh, uh, one thing is really, they, a lot of states, uh, because the Erie Canal, Erie Canal was initially financed by taxes and tolls, made a tax system to fund. And the they didn't end up needing the taxes because it was so successful. So they funded entirely on tolls. In fact, they ended up using it to create a kind of internal invest, uh, industrial development bank. That's how much money they made on the Erie Canal. And so a bunch of states decided we're going to build all this infrastructure and not have taxes because it's just going to be so awesome. Um, Pay for uh, itself. Jim, huh? Yeah, Jim Wallace calls this taxless finance. Anyway, come uh, the 1840s, you start seeing uh, the, the the piper needs to be paid. Um, eventually, uh, credit conditions dry up, um, and a bunch of states come close to defaulting. So, including New York, which had expanded the Erie Canal, Ohio, Tennessee, Alabama came close, and then a bunch of states do default. So, some of the biggest state, Pennsylvania and Maryland, default. Uh, Pennsylvania and Maryland's default is somewhat temporary. They just eventually raise taxes. But you see uh, repudiations in Arkansas and uh, Louisiana and the territory of Florida. And you see partial repudiations in Indiana, Illinois, Michigan. Mississippi also repudiated. Um, uh, and um, it was a huge crisis. It ended up being um, like a diplomatic crisis. A whole bunch of things happened. Um, and Congress considered a bill, which is again they just they'd done a uh, a assumption of state debts in after the War of eighteen twelve, and they'd done one after the Revolutionary War, and so it wasn't crazy to think um, that they would come and bail out the states in this regard and assume their debts again. Um, but uh, they decided not to. 
Um, and they decided not to, like, pretty explicitly for on moral hazard uh, grounds. Um, and this had a huge effect on a variety of things. So um, states start adopting their balanced budget and debt limit rules that we still see today. Um, and uh, states, uh, as a result, stop borrowing mostly. Um, uh, and uh, this is kind of a neat encapsulation of the trilemma. The federal government had no capacity to do a bailout um, um, or thought, considered doing a bailout and decided not to. Um, uh, it, uh, it could have, uh, the states could have paid their creditors. Um, the federal government could have done something to kind of encourage them to do so, um, uh, but it didn't. Um, and as a result, the creditors took the hit. And this uh, may have created short-term effects on moral, long-term effects on moral hazard and short-term effects on the economy that were positive, but the negative effect of making states uh, not good conduits for doing future investment. And so it has this very, very big effect on uh, on what happens. And so after this point, states, until basically the rise of the automobile, become very, very small players in infrastructure, and all of the action moves to local governments. Um, but again, I think this encapsulates the trilemma. Like they thought about it, bailout. Uh, if we do a bailout, then we will encourage moral hazard, but we'll have the effect of kind of uh, creating more confidence with British investors. Um, uh, we decided not to do that, and that had this big effect on, on kind of credit flows and future infrastructure spending. Okay. And that, that was the defining crisis. I mean, as you said, moving forward, state uh, balanced budget laws, a, a number of lasting legacies from that pivotal event, including the impressions you discussed earlier that aren't completely right, but the impression that it's hands off because of this defining moment. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Let's, let's move to the um, other big area where you saw a lot of uh, – debate and developments on this issue, and that was railroad bonds. And that spans, you know, half a century, 1840s to 1880s or so, or close to that long. So talk about that and how that was consequential in this conversation. Really good. So this is a question about, like, you see policy making in the courts along these dimensions. You, know, you see a few other exec, kind of executive getting involved. Um, so states are out of the infrastructure game. We're at the beginning of the railroad era. Um, and states, uh, um, state courts particularly start allowing local governments to um, not be bound by the rules of their state debt limit and public purpose requirement rules, and instead allow them to borrow to fund railroads. And this has a little bit of, I mean, you read the history here, it's a little bit like the monorail episode of The Simpsons. Like there, there are these people going around the country saying, you know, invest in this, railroad needs to come to your town. And uh, there were real reasons you'd want this, so that when railroad came through your town during this period, it had a huge effect on where firms located. Right. So like firms wanted to locate near the railroad hubs, where the firms located, then their suppliers located had these big agglomerative effects. And so being a hub was a really big deal. Um, and cities all over the country responded to this by basically taking public money and giving it to railroad companies. Um, they, buy, they did it in a couple of different things, by stock in railroad companies. Um, they did a few other things. And uh, this then had... Uh, Eventually, like railroad, the way railroads work is that like you could oversupply can be really bad because you end up with low marginal uh, 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 marginal cost of providing and you can't cover your debt service. Um, and a lot of railroads went bankrupt um, in in several successive crises. We built a lot of railroads all at once. Um, and you guys, you can read Douglas North. You can read whoever you want about this broader broader economic history. Um, uh, but the um, the what happened inside the states is that states started. Uh, cities started repudiating their debts. They said, the "Railroad, you know, either the railroad didn't come, or the railroad did come and didn't produce the the, the promised economic effects. Um, we're just not going to pay this." And state courts um, very much uh, kind of endorsed this view, and they ended up ruling that a lot of this debt that was issued was um, ultra vires; it was not legal, and therefore creditors couldn't ask for the money back. And the Supreme Court then came in and said, but they were hearing the cases because there was a diversity of jurisdiction you know, the people investors from one state and um, the city of the other state, and ended up basically overruling state Supreme Courts about the meaning of state law um, in a, a series of completely wild cases. Um, and so this is something that'll be more interesting to your lawyer crowd than to your other listeners, but the this is um, the Swift versus Tyson regime where the federal government was making a lot, federal courts were making a lot of common law and in these cases, they just kind of went into this kind of swaggering policy making mode where they said, like, the, the municipal bond market's really important. We need to ensure its safety, and we're just not going to let your podunk town 
uh, uh, not pay its debts, no matter how bad it is. And this need recession, I mean, caused huge problems in lot towns in Iowa. You saw like, crime increasing because they had to fire all their police officers. You saw real devastation. Uh, but the federal government was very, federal courts were very committed to preserving the, the municipal bond market um, in this period. And uh, the effect of this was that the municipal bond market was preserved despite all of these defaults. So again, it had real negative effects. There was no bailout. Um, so the question was the allocation of the harm. The Supreme Court came down very hard on behalf of the creditors against the current taxpayers. Um, uh, one notable and interesting thing is that during the same period, um, roughly speaking, kind of the later part of this period, a bunch of states default. So the southern states default, um, mostly default in, in the 1870s following, um, following the end of Reconstruction. They uh, they default saying that the bonds taken out during the debt the debt taken out during Reconstruction was um, taken by uh, governments that don't represent us with all the um, kind of political meaning you might imagine that that includes um, and uh, the federal government created modern sovereign immunity uh, doctrine in order to protect them so in the state default cases they come out in favor of the states and in the city ones they come out in favor of the creditors and this had some pretty predictable effects. So um, in the cities, the bond market was preserved. And in the future, you end up seeing huge amounts in the 1880s, 1890s, and 19, early 1900s, huge amounts of investment in municipal infrastructure. People are still willing to lend to it. Um, uh, and uh, they understand that there's some kind of legal backstop. So there's this short-term harm, but you get this new investment. And in the Southern states, you see um, uh, creditors are not interested. And so Arkansas, who's kind of the American Argentina, because they default three times, they default in the 1840s, huh. they default in the 1870s, and they default in the 1930s, like is barred, can't borrow money for a large swath of the 19th century, um, and notably doesn't build a lot of infrastructure. Um, and so you see in two contemporary crises in response to kind of differing politics surrounding them, um, two different uh, kind of two different kind of choices along the trilemma, and uh, with the predictable benefits and the predictable costs associated with them. Interesting. So we see the trilemma at work, as you just said, in, in this, these cases. And it was also fascinating to see Arkansas being this poster child of uh, <laughs> bad experience with state finances and having to try and find creditors. All right, let's let's move to, to oh, more. Oh, wait, quickly, wait, quickly. The, I focus on courts here, but it, lots of other stuff happened here. There's yeah. totally wild stories. So at one point, for instance, we're, it's 1870, and there are a bunch of Iowa towns that are refusing to pay, uh, and refusing to accede to federal court uh, decisions. And President Grant threatens to send the U.S. military. It's the middle of Reconstruction, and this is Iowa. You know, like yeah. northern, staunch northern state. And he threatens to send federal troops to enforce these bond contracts, which is like crazy. <laughs> uh, but that's how seriously the government took it. Another crazy story is that so a bunch of uh, cities tried to avoid these federal um, uh, these federal judgments on behalf of creditors. And one of the weird formalities of them was that uh, if the federal courts thought they had the power to order sitting officials to um, raise taxes to pay for bonds, but they couldn't raise taxes without those sitting officials. So the first thing you saw was um, st uh, state and local officials started hiding from federal marshals. Uh, the federal really? marshals would have to hunt them down in a, a game of cat and mouse. <laughs> then they started getting wise to this, and what they would do was they would get elected, they'd conduct all their official business, and then they'd resign. And the city would be without a mayor or whatever for several years, so there's no one to put these orders on. The final and most kind of most ridiculous version of this were something called corporate suicides. So in the um, uh, 18th, most of it happens mostly in the 1870s and 1880s, uh, a bunch of state legislatures see their cities are uh, bankrupt and there are these federal judgments against them. Uh, and what they do is they they establish a new government. So in Mo this happened in Memphis, it happened in Mo D Duluth, Minnesota, it happens in Mobile, Alabama. And in Mobile, they create a new city called the Port of Mobile. And the state Crate says the Port of Mobile now has the power to tax property in Mobile. It changes the, the, the boundary slightly. But they, 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 they take the power to tax away from the city of Mobile, give it to this new city called the Port of Mobile. The Port of Mobile then buys all of the assets from the city of Mobile for $1 or something. And the creditors are left suing the city of Mobile, which has no assets and no taxing authority. <laughs> and the Supreme Court kind of says, no, you can't do this. And they don't really explain why. 
or what the lead, they just like, no, nah, that's not happening. Um, and this raises some really interesting questions that I'm going to explore in the second paper about the real, and do a little bit in this paper about the relationship between these cases and things like the Cofina bonds in Puerto Rico, which are a, a classier version of a similar move. But the stories are just nuts because this is, you know, happening over the course of a few, it's the biggest economic issue or one of the biggest economic issues in the country during these periods. And the large portion of the country, or court, country are in revolt against the Supreme Court, which is acting on behalf of kind of moneyed interests and bondholders uh, in, in New York and in London. So how was this all resolved? I mean, so states, localities had one view. They were against these these federal rulings toward them. The federal government, of course, could send troops in. But I mean, at, at some point, we got to some equilibrium where states accepted this, I guess, right? So Yeah, so cities, it is mostly that cities. cities okay. Yeah, so cities end up, they end up, most of these things get negotiated out and end up because the, the you know, you can only get so much juice from a rock uh, or whatever it is, the, uh, the metaphor you want to choose here. Um, they end up negotiating a lot of these things and uh, the creditors take some haircuts, but not as extreme okay. haircuts as they would have taken under the kind of state, state, state laws. And the, the market, like, it, I mean, it ends up working in lots of different ways in different places and the effects are, but again, I, I don't want to understate how big the, the local map shock, shock. These are huge recessions and you have cities firing all of their public workers. Um, and cities are a pretty big deal economically then. I'm um, not quite as big as they are now, but they're great. You know, like, this is a really big, big deal. Um, uh, and you have like a real austerity caucus in the Supreme Court. Um, uh, but again, it has this other side, which is that in the later period, American cities built infrastructure like nowhere else. So America's uh, in capital spending in American cities at the turn of the last century was way, 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 way better. Capital infrastructure was way, way better than it was in European cities. Um, there's this wonderful quote from this unbelievably terrific historian named John Tiford, where he writes about the city of Chicago, where he says, the city of Chicago had ordained that the level of the swampy city be raised 10 feet, and it had been done. It ordered that the flow of the Chicago River be reversed, and so it was reversed. The achievements of government in Chicago at times rivaled the feats of the Old Testament God. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, it's like it's. The, and wow. when we think about when we think about the things we love in cities, a lot of them are products of this period. Central Park, um, the, a lot of the bridges, the Croton Aqueducts. Oh, they, we built this extraordinary amount of infrastructure. Our street, we had more water. We had. Uh, wildly more water infrastructure than you saw in London or Berlin. Um, uh, and it was partially because cities could borrow and they didn't have to ask the uh, the political metropole. They didn't have to go to Washington to say, can I borrow in order to build? They just yeah. borrowed and built. And the, there was this capital market that it kind of in, enabled this and it had really big benefits as well as having had these, uh, but it was, uh, it was built on the backs of these extraordinary costs. Yeah, another way of saying that is because they were forced, the cities were forced to sacrifice unemployment on the altar of moral hazard concerns. They were able later to have great investment projects. Yeah, it's a trilemma. Yep. There are benefits and costs at all sides of how you decide it. And again, like you, we see in the southern states, kind of a, the other side of this, where you see they default and people are really skeptical about lending the money uh, during this in very, very important period of development. That's interesting because I have looked a little bit into the history of the South between, you know, the Civil War and really World War II. And it's really like a separate economy from the rest of the U.S. It's, it, it's, it's divergent, doesn't start catching up until after World War II. And this may have been a contributing factor to it. Yeah, it's, it's not the only piece here, right? Sure. Like obviously, a lot's going on. I'm, I'm telling a through line through American history. But yeah, it's, it's yeah. one but piece it's, among many. But like, it is in fact the case that you know that there was there there were real negative effects to not paying your creditors if you're going to ask them for money again in the future. I mean, interesting. There's a debate about this now in the um, kind of uh, about the effect of say international sovereign defaults. Like, how big an effect does it have on future borrowing? Um, but at the time, it was pretty clear. Uh, that it had a very, very large effect um, on on willingness to let. So, for instance, a bunch of um, southern state bonds were not allowed on bond exchanges in London and New York until from the 1870s until the 19, till 1910s. It, that doesn't mean they weren't borrowing at all, but it does mean that there was like real limits on their ability to do so. Um, one other kind of interesting dilemma is that following the First World War, British asked the U.S. government for offsets against money that had been that had been lent to uh, uh, British for the losses that they'd suffered in that their investors had suffered in 
um, uh, the, in the 1870s with Southern states. She said, look, we didn't get paid back by your states. We, our national government doesn't have to pay you back by that amount. And the US government said, no, it's not how it works. <laughs> we're not Alabama. And Brits were like, what's the difference between you and Alabama? Um, uh, and so it was, uh, yeah, it became a big international so- like sovereign, like big political crisis. Well, David, this has been very fascinating. We are running low on time, and we didn't have time to get into the fascinating case study of New York City and and Washington, D.C. most recently. So I encourage our listeners to read the paper. Um, And and again, it shows that the hands-off approach is not quite right. The federal government has been involved um, in in local um, budget issues. But talk us through the implications of this for the current crisis. What are the takeaway points? So I think the um, in some more recent crises from New York City through Detroit, um, uh, we've seen a, a increased willingness to rather than choose one leg of the trilemma, to choose a little bit of pain along all three di- thing, uh, dilemma, which is that you demand some austerity, you provide a little bit of aid, um, depending on where you provide it. It's an interesting question, a uh, when rather, um, and you ask creditors to take a certain a certain amount of hit through uh, municipal bankruptcy law, for instance, or in New York's case, a slightly different uh, regime. Uh, so one thing to say about this is that if we face a big city crisis or an Illinois or a Connecticut uh, a default crisis, I suspect the answer along the term will not be all of one or all of the other, but rather a little bit of each. Um, and we need to think about the, I think the big policy question is not, or that, or at least what I can offer towards the policy question is not how to choose between these three big concerns. Um, obviously, there's a lot going on there, um, and it will implicate your ideology, will affect it, all sorts of things would affect your choice along with it, but rather how can we design um, policy tools that will for instance, if we're doing bailout, do, provide the, create the least amount of moral hazard, or if we're going to ask creditors to take a hit through a bankruptcy-like regime or a default, um, uh, to uh, spread that cost broadly so it has the least effect on the, on the bond market. Um, and similarly, if we're going to ask for austerity, how can we make austerity as li- little as kind of create as le- little pain as possible? Um, and you're you know, when, one of the things that I think is interesting is that you see in um, uh, we, we distribute our policy response across a lot of dimensions. So in the Detroit bankruptcy case, the court is directly weighing these types of concerns in a kind of a, through a doctrine called service delivery and solvency with the details of which are not super important, but the court is directly weighing, like how much should I ask Detroit to cut before I, we allow some pain to be felt by, by creditors. So I, as a policy matter, I think that two things, kind of two broad, uh, kind of uh, 10,000 feet type concerns. One is the extent you can provide aid that doesn't implicate moral hazard concerns, like the general state aid where every state gets it, um, that's pretty attractive. Because again, the choices when you get to a jurisdiction on the edge of default are really ugly. And so to the extent you can, that the I'm a big fan of the kind of big, big amounts of general federal aid, which I don't think create too much moral hazard. They create a little, but not too much because you get it even if you're not in bad, in bad fiscal shape. The second thing I'd say is that um, uh, the federal government needs to come up with mechanisms. So if it's going to provide a specific bailout to Illinois, so the head of the Illinois State Senate asked for a specific the like Illinois specific grant, we need to think about ways in which that money can be given um, uh, that are reduce the moral hazard concerns. And similarly, we're going to need to reform municipal bankruptcy law in certain ways in order to make it uh, have like less harm on, on creditors or so that we undermine the municipal bond market a little bit less. And you can think about lots of ways you can do that. I'm currently working on a follow-up paper that will have like kind of narrow targeted policy constrictions. But those are the big dynamics are, um, first off, if you can avoid a fiscal crisis or a series of, of local fiscal crises, you should definitely try to do that because there are no good answers in any of these situations. Every single one of these story, stories is a sad story in one way or another. Um, the second is that modern policy, maybe I'll say three. So the second is that modern policy responses don't just choose one leg of the trilemma, but can kind of distribute the harm across all three parts of it. And I think that's probably an attractive solution. Um, you need to do less on each and any one leg if you distribute it across all of them. And then the third is um, that there are, you can sort of start thinking about narrow kind of ways to do. So if you do bailouts, can you create, can you build in certain conditionality into it? Um, uh, for austerity, like how can we make infrastructure spending more uh, efficient 
if what we're worried about is infrastructure spending all right, in the future, well, there's a lot of waste in infrastructure spending. So maybe if we're going to harm the mutual bond market, we could whatever money we get, we can make it go further. Um, and you could think about lots of things along these dimensions, but ultimately there's a political choice, which is like, if there, if a jurisdiction is in severe fiscal trouble, there's going to be pain. And uh, it is an unavoidable fact that there's going to be pain and we need to, um, and like it has to be allocated somewhere. Okay. Well, with that, our time is up. Our guest today has been David Schleicher. David, thank you so much for coming on the show again. Thank you so much. It was really fun. Macro Musings is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. If you haven't already, please subscribe via iTunes or your favorite podcast app. And while you're there, please consider rating us and leaving a review. This helps other thoughtful people like you find the podcast. Thanks for listening.